We will continue this conversation on elevating the health benefits of the arts in policy conversations in our first panel of the day, which will be chaired by our dear colleague and collaborator, Susan Meg Salmon, Executive Director of the International Arts and Mind Lab. Over to you, Susan. Thank you, Nisha. Um, so I'd like to um, describe our panel as sort of a performance art piece. Um, it's quite improvisational. We have a lot of things going on. We'll have some folks coming in from the outside that we'll talk to in a moment. So um, it's a ride. Let's see how it goes. Um, I, I would like to start by just saying that this is a really big deal, right? Like what we're doing is really cool and it hasn't been done before. Uh, you know, listening to Patrick talk about the science um, is so interesting because the truth of the matter is that the artists have always been there and they got there first. And science is just catching up. And I think science is super important, but it's really in the collaboration between the scientists and the artists and the institutions that um, are helping to create structure and container that really makes a difference. So we're gonna jump right in. Um, you know, uh, so folks have talked a lot about interdisciplinary work. Um, we've talking about this idea of policy in our panel, this, this go round. And uh, when I think about policy, I th often think about things like climate change or climate science or bioethics, even women's health. You know, those areas of, of work and impact and response really came together and coalesced when policy came round to that. But policy is sort of an amorphous term that um, can be used in workplace, it can be wor used in education, it can be used in, um, in governments, it can be used at a local level, it can be used at a global level. So we want to kind of unpack policy a bit today and start to think about what that means as we spend um, the rest of the day on a journey understanding so many other aspects of this work. So um, on our panel today is Renee Fleming, and Renee is going to be sharing a bit of her work both as an advocate and also as a real leader in bringing policy together all around the world related to arts and health. Um, Sunil um, Iyengar is here from the National Endowment for the Arts. You can see him on screen. Um, Aduke Gomez is joining us from Africa, and we'll be talking a bit about art for life. Uh, Christopher, who you met earlier, will be sharing some of his thoughts about policy. But we're going to open this up with a video by um, Ernesto Otona, who's, who is the Assistant uh, General, uh, sorry, Assistant Director General of UNESCO, to talk a bit about his perspective on how the arts and health come together from a policy perspective. So let's see if we can make that happen. It is my great pleasure to join you the World Health Organization and the Met in opening this policy discussion on the role of art and culture for health. In recent decades, we have seen growing evidence on the importance of culture for our health. Culture-based health intervention have proven to be effective not only from a public health perspective, but also an economic one. They support artists and creative industries and have proven to be equally or even more cost-effective compared to other health interventions. However, although some countries have made progress in developing policies that link culture and health, culture remains an underutilized resource for our physical and mental health. With COVID-19, we have seen new interest in the links between culture and health. Artists and cultural professionals have helped us battle the isolation and anxiety that come with the pandemic greatly supporting our mental health. As we seek to capitalize on the power of culture for health, we cannot forget the physical and mental health of artists and cultural professionals. Often faced with tenuous uh, contracts, unfair remuneration, and a lack of social safety nets and sick leave, artists and cultural professionals share specific vulnerabilities when it comes to physical and mental health. These vulnerabilities has only intensified with COVID-19. UNESCO has made the well-being and resilience of artists the center of its COVID-19 response. We have launched the Resilient Movement in over 118 countries and have worked to put culture at the top of the policy agenda of the G20. Next year, in Mexico, we will hold Mondia Cult, the first major international conference on culture policy in over 30 years. 
Advocating for culture as a universal public good, one that is essential for health, will be among our top priorities. Pablo Picasso once said, everything you can imagine is real. Today's symposium is an opportunity to imagine a new vision of health, one that fully integrates the healing power of art and culture. Thank you. Thank you, that's really amazing. Renee, I'd love to. Renee, I'd love to turn it over to you. I think so much of what Ernesto says really resonates around the artist, but also the opportunity and this idea of collaboration and connection. And I know you have a great story on how you really began your journey in thinking about this role in arts and health. Yes, thank you, Susan. First of all, what a privilege for me to share the stage with you and with Christopher Bailey. Uh, Someday we'll sing together. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, this idea about policy actually brought me recently to a conversation with Senator Leahy and other members of Congress to try and, and put something in, in terms of funding for music research at the NIH, uh, the integrative medicine. And so much of this I didn't even know existed when I started on this journey. Uh, it's become so important and so fascinating because COVID has given us the opportunity to fully understand that we are whole people who need to be nourished, as Patrick said, in every possible way. And so suddenly, this whole sector is flourishing in the last year and a half, from what I can tell. There are so many organizations working together. So my journey began, of course, with my entire life because I have witnessed firsthand, as I've sung around the world, and another privilege, uh, how much music has affected people. How so many people have come up to me and said, you know, your music got me through uh, illness or loss, or, uh, you know, I survived cancer by listening to these three albums over and over again. And I always thought that was really um, interesting. And, uh, and, 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 of course, for me, music has been incredibly important, but it's my profession. Uh, and it's a passion, but it seems that it's important for a lot of people. Uh, and of course, I see this intersection as being all of the arts-based and who we are as people, what we, what we can, beauty for me, natural beauty is incredibly important, for instance. But I started about six years ago, uh, this started at a dinner party where I met Francis Collins and uh, I had always been interested in reading up on research about music because I had terrible stage fright at some periods in my life that almost derailed my career. I also had a lot of pain, which I now know as somatic pain, as a hedge against uh, performance anxiety. It would lift magically the minute I got on stage, but I suffered a lot in advance. So uh, none of these things were easy to solve, um, and also the mind-body connection one has to feel very strongly about if you're ever gonna learn to sing virtuosically. And virtuosity, of course, is something in my field as a classical singer that's been honed over centuries. Um, I once sang with a very large dog on stage of the Met. This wasn't planned. The dog just joined in with me. So um, we have that connection to animals as well. But five, after meeting Francis Collins, I said I was just appointed creative consultant to the Kennedy Center, two great national institutions. How about if we collaborate? because I think the arts could be provide a platform for science. I think it's fascinating what you're doing, and I think my public would enjoy it as well. So that's how we started in 2017 at a conference table, uh, sitting around at the NIH and hearing presentations for two days, and I was on fire and passionate about this intersection, and I've been working ever since. Um, Sunil is a colleague, he'll tell you about his project with us. Uh, Sound Health at the uh, Kennedy Center did just that. We've had a lot of convenings, we've had performances in which scientists and musicians and artists present together. Uh, I took it on the road because I tour most of the time and now wherever I perform, I offer a presentation that gives an overview of the sector and I try to present with local scientists, researchers, and healthcare providers. Uh, and very often, these collaborations between, and we're, by the way, we're all service providers, between this arts institution and the scientists continues. 
because data is everything in our country, as you know. Nothing gets done in the medical field without data. Other countries are happy to embrace things that work, but the U.S. really requires that. And I learned in the beginning this is so granular. So sound health has really blossomed. Uh, I did a, a webinar at the beginning of, of COVID, which now lives at UCSF, which I'm very proud of. And recently, I saw that there were long COVID patients who were still having difficulty breathing. And I thought, gosh, how can we contribute? Well, singers are experts on breathing. It's, it's how we're trained. It's the foundation of our art. So uh, with Google Arts and Culture, there are 14 great singers and actors who share their favorite breathing exercise and sing a stanza to try and give people hope, to try and also give people some tools for extending breath. Um, and uh, that's one of the things. And we're creating a consortium now to try and figure out how do we get data from this, what works, what is really uh, possible with, a t with something like this, and how can it help other people with different lung disorders. So we just keep going, and it's incredibly exciting, and I have brilliant, brilliant colleagues, so I'm, I'm privileged and thrilled to be here with you. Thank you, Renee. Renee is also the co-director, co-chair of the NeuroArts Blueprint, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, but i um, been very focused on thinking about how do you take these very fragmented fields and bring them together and create a roadmap. So as an advocate and also as a creative director and as a, a person who's using the arts for, for healing, you really have such a, a range of ways that you've entered this. So to talk to Sunil a little bit about um, the role of the NEA and the role of the NIH. And Sunil, I know you were gonna share a little bit about how and why research is so important, especially in the United States, but also for global policy to think about how do we really harness that information. So thanks for joining us today. Uh-oh, as I said, performance art. Hi, hi, it's great to be with you today. Can you hear me? Good? Gotcha. Yes? Okay, great. I'm just sorry I couldn't join you in person. Uh, let me just say that it's especially a privilege to speak at an event held in partnership with the World Health Organization uh, because my grandfather on my mom's side was a public health director who worked closely with WHO and Larry Brilliant in the early 70s to eradicate smallpox from India. So I feel it's a nice place to be. Um, so about the uses of research, uh, you know, when we talk about, uh, Susan, about advancing any public policy objective, whether it involves the arts, or any other type of intervention to achieve a social good, we are of course obliged to trot out scientific evidence that speaks of the generalizability, generalizability of these benefits. Um, we seek to establish causal relationships between the activity or program and the outcome of interest, say in this case, physical health, social or emotional well-being, or symptom relief from chronic or acute disorders. We also look to understand the mechanisms of action. How does the activity or program work and under what optimal conditions so that the process can be replicated at scale. Okay, so we know all this about the role of and importance of evidence and policy, but I want, what I wanted to suggest, Susan, is that even when we talk about you know, guiding policy to advance the arts and health, which is the topic of this panel, we shouldn't lose sight of the power of storytelling, of the arts themselves to communicate instantly their benefits to people and communities, as you know, Chris did brilliantly today in the opening. And in short, we don't need to wait for the ironclad, large-scale, randomized control study with full-blown neurobiological or psychological pre and post assessments to start urging public health practitioners and policymakers to take a closer look, especially since um, the integration of arts and health programs and therapies likely will prove more cost-effective, as we know, than employing standard of care alone. Uh, what we need is more of an R&D-oriented approach to pilot such in interventions and rigorously collect data along the way. Um, you know, like Renee was mentioning with her new initiative, a data that can speak not only to the value and impact of these therapies and interventions, but that can allow for their continuous improvement so that greater and more equitable distribution of their benefits can be realized. So at the NEA, we support research grants and what are called NEA research labs, which are academic research centers around the country that partner with artists, creative arts therapists, and uh, arts organizations to pursue multi-year research agendas about the arts in relation to a host of different topics. So several of our labs are investigating the arts relationship to social and emotional well-being and to physical or physiological health. For example, we're supporting research labs at Drexel University. I know Yoka Bratt will be speaking at the next panel. 
and also the Epi Arts Lab at University of Florida, where Jill Sankey is working with Daisy Fancourt in the UK. And Daisy's also on that panel. All of these labs support a learn-as-you-go approach. They strive not only to publish papers, but to leave behind toolkits and evidence-based guides to help practitioners in the field. As part of the greater push for building capacity in research and evidence-based practice in the arts and health, we're pleased to support the Sound Health Network at UCSF, uh, which has grown out of the Sound Health Initiative Renee has described in which she's been so instrumental in shaping. The Sound Health Network is an online clearinghouse, a national convener and networking platform for research and practice at the intersection of music, neuroscience, health and well-being. Finally, I want to spotlight the NEA's flagship um, health, arts and health initiative, um, the Creative Forces NEA Military Healing Arts Network, an initiative of our agency in partnership with U.S. Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs. It seeks to improve the health, well-being, and quality of life for military and veteran populations exposed to trauma, as well as their families and caregivers. So the NEA funds creative arts therapists, equipment, and supplies at clinical sites across the nation, including telehealth delivery of care for patients in rural and remote areas. But what's exciting from a research perspective is that many of the creative arts therapists at these sites around the country are collaborating with us on studies about the impacts of those interventions. Some of the findings to date show that creative arts therapists can, therapies can enable recovery from traumatic experiences, reduce symptoms linked with post-traumatic stress, foster the ability to experience hope and gratification, and reduce isolation and stigma from traumatic brain injuries and related psychological health issues. And again, we're trying to post publicly what we find as soon as we find it and to translate the evidence into practitioner tools. So you let me talk for a while, I'll just end by saying, Susan, that if the overarching research question over the last decade or so has been whether the arts have positive impacts on health and well-being, perhaps we should shift the fulcrum of this exchange to precisely how are those impacts manifest, under what optimal conditions, and for which populations, so we can extend such opportunities rapidly and deliberately to the greatest number of people who can most benefit from them. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Sunil. And I think there's a real question about sustainability and scalability. And that's also part of the role of, of what policy does. Uh, creative Forces that Sunil mentioned has an interesting legacy beyond the amazing work that um, Creative Forces does for military and their families in clinic and community. It turns out that this model can also be used for folks that have not been in the military that have similar issues of trauma, things like sexual abuse or childhood trauma. So we're learning a lot from this military model that's funded by multiple agencies to share with other parts of the community. So again, the way policy weaves its way through is so interesting. Um, I'd like to turn to Aduke. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, could you tell us a bit about your program and share sort of how you've localized the policy in um, Nigeria? Hi, Aduke. Oh, it looks like she may be frozen. I think she's unable to hear you. Ah, that was a voice from Sunil. Well, let's do this. Um, while we're trying to figure this out, we have another video that we'd like to share from you from Australia. And this is another aspect of the way policy is manifested. In Australia, you'll hear that there's actually a national framework for arts and health. And Lisa Cooley in, is gonna share, and Emma O'Brien are gonna share a little bit about that work. Can we cue that video? We are meeting on stolen land here from the First Nations people of Australia. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and also to recognise the extraordinary connection that the First Nations people have with arts and wellbeing. In 2014, the National Australian Arts and Health Framework was endorsed by the Australian Minister for the Arts and the Australian Minister for Health and all their counterparts across the states and territories. This was the first time that health and the arts came together to agree and endorse a very important national policy document. Minister Hill um, was really a serious champion for this process. And it was him who said, we need to get an agreement between all of our ministers around Australia, arts and health together, that you know, to agree that this is an area that we need to invest in. Because what we actually found was we brought practitioners together who I think didn't necessarily see themselves in the set, that they were in the same 
you know, business, if yep. you like, mm -hmm. and it was listening to each other, understanding that they all had very similar challenges, that they, you know, that process of really unearthing, you know, the issues and the concerns, but also the extraordinary depth of the practice that was mm. out there was a really important part of bringing together the policy. And look, that process then resulted in a national gathering of all of those people. It became a much more, okay, oh, actually, we are all working towards greater well-being for the community, whether they're in a health setting or in a community setting. Do you think that, you know, really that nitty-gritty of getting the framework right, let's face it, there were a lot of edits, and, and yeah. really championing that clarity of language, do you think that really helped with that? Definitely. We ended up with a very, very good and clear piece of work. But as you said, the evidence and the research piece was actually really important as well, mm -hmm. not just relying on, you know, the, the what the practitioners were talking to us all about, but also bringing together that evidence base in a in an understandable form because we knew that we were never going to broach that health environment if we didn't have mm -hmm. that evidence base behind us. One thing that's definitely been acknowledged is the extraordinary impact that the pandemic has had on people's mental health and well-being and you and I were both in the, <laughs> listening to a, a forum that's been gathered by the Australian Council about the power of the arts to now, interestingly enough, influence policy <laughs> in oh, yeah. mental health and well-being to help rebuild and recover and, 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 and honour the pandemic experience yes. as well. The pandemic, in some respects, has actually brought the arts much, much more closely mm. into focus and a recognition of its its value and its power. You have arts and health embedded in, in the community in, in the city of Sydney. Yes. Now look, I think I think what's really happened, certainly in the kind of work that I do at a at a local government level, that the arts now are so much part and parcel of how we work. Um, with our community so you know it's it's part of our social programs it's check in with our community you know how they're going with their well-being and a big mm. part of that is about how they get to experience the arts do they feel as though they you know they're accessible you know you're amongst the first people to say hey this is going to be tricky but we kind of need a policy <laughs> and and look at the beautiful work that you've enabled it's great thanks and thanks Emma So unfortunately, Aduke will not be able to join us, but I hope that you'll look out for her Arts for Life program, um, and we'll hope... Ah, oh, she's here! <laughs> Somewhere, Aduke is here. Aduke, while we have you, let's do it. Yes. You want to tell us a bit about your work? Yes. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm so honoured and privileged to be here virtually at the Met, working with you and, and the great work that um, WHO is doing in this respect. Um, Art, Art for Life, I'm the chair of Art for Life, which is an initiative of the Lagos State Ministry of Health. It was set up by the Honorable Commissioner under the aegis of, of the governor. Art for Life was set up to introduce um, art and the factors of, of art into the entire healthcare process and to, to provide art interventions both for the patients, the health workers, and the carers of the patients. Um, we were inaugurated in October 2019, just before COVID. And so uh, um, what we, on the screen behind us, you can see our inauguration. And, and what, we, what we did really during COVID was we, we had, we took musicians into the, um, COVID centers between April and October every weekend. And we held concerts, which helped both the patients and the healthcare workers because the, the relief of the stress for the health workers who, I mean, at that time, as, as we all know, they were under such immense pressure. And for the patients who had been um, in the in the in the isolation centers and were sort of left alone. Um, if the slides can just move quickly, because I know I don't have much time. What we also 
did as well was to actually um, provide visual arts so that the health, the, the hospitals are more appealing. You can see, you can see that some of the artworks and the, the murals that we've put in place in the various hospitals. Because when you're in hospital, as you know, you need art to actually concentrate and to, and to, and to be able to ease the senses. Um, art for Life is the first of this initiative in the States and indeed in Nigeria. And one of the reasons why I was so excited to be on this panel is because um, just recently with, with, with our board, we've been discussing how do we formalize the initiatives we've been taken? How do we ensure that the, the medical students, the art students, how do they come together to understand? Because traditionally arts and, and sciences are sort of really kept apart, but if we can get art students to, to, to understand that, that art therapy is a, is a possible profession, if we can get the medical students to understand the importance of art, then I think that um, we, as a committee, we would have done a lot. And I think this can only be done by policy and by ensuring that what the work we've done is formalized. So um, these are what we've done so far. You, you can see in this particular video, you can see that there's, we, we wrote inspirational messages on, on, on the walls. And we found that from the feedback from social media, that patients really, really appreciated this. And I think that during COVID, it's been said before, but I think it's worth repeating. Our, the whole pandemic and the lockdown, it was art that allowed us to get through it. Reading, TV, books, stories, dance, even baking and cooking. If, if not for art and the ability it has to settle you, to put you in a good mental space, I think that we would have been the lesser for it. So that's my introduction to Art for Life. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Beautiful. Thank you. I think it's noteworthy that so many of these programs really responded without hesitation to a need. And now we're thinking very deeply about how do you institutionalize it? How do you formalize it? How do you create that policy? And Chris, I'd love to have you, you've heard all of these amazing stories. I'd love your insight on sort of what's policy mean to you and how do we sort of build this up? Well, I, I always like to, uh, is my microphone working or it do is. I? Okay, great. Um, I always like to begin with the simple reality of what we're talking about. Uh, and policy comes from the Greek root for city, polis. And it's really about a shared understanding of how we manage a group with prudence and wisdom. And to get to that state of wisdom, you need information. Uh, you need evidence, but you also need acquired experience. And that's why policymakers need to have at the table artists, healthcare givers, researchers, and a group that we haven't really talked about, the people we're trying to serve. They have to be at the table uh, to, to make that policy, to make that policy not only effective, but to ensure that the vulnerable and underrepresented of our society receive not just some benefit, but most of the benefit. Uh, because one of the things that this pandemic, I think, has taught us is that as long as the underrepresented are not receiving the vaccine, are not receiving the care, all of us are at risk. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and in fact, that notion of, of compassion, of this being a struggle that we struggle with together, which is key to the arts, uh, is something that has to be key to policy, because that fundamentally is what makes us human. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd, I'd like to bring up the F word here, um, funding. Um, I'd love to, <laughs> at the end of the day, um, 
these programs need funding. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear the panelists talk a little bit about funding. And um, Sunil, I think I'd love to talk with you, have you start to talk about sort of what are the funding streams and opportunities to think this through? And, and how, do we, how do we get creative about public and private funding and partnerships? Government level, you know, I have to acknowledge the NEA is a relatively small agency, but I think we pack a lot of uh, might, perhaps, in the way we work with other larger federal agencies to kind of uh, have, for example, we have something called an interagency task force in the arts and human development, which meets every quarter, involves a lot of other federal agencies, including the National Institutes of Health, um, and Emmeline is on it, who's going to be speaking soon. Um, and we try to get together and talk about funding opportunities, but also research opportunities at the shared space, the arts and human development and health. But it does require leadership and it requires the individual agencies to take an initiative. So I wanted to say that we're really proud to be able to welcome soon, hopefully, our uh, the new uh, chair. So uh, President Biden has appointed a new chair for the National Endowment for the Arts, Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson, who's steeped in a lot of this work at a community level. And she brings particularly a lens from the creative placemaking side, which some of you have heard of that movement, uh, looking at revitalizing communities through the arts and, of course, looking at broader social cohesion and health related outcomes. She brings a really evidence and lived experience kind of perspective to this. So I'm hoping that'll of course catalyze some thinking in our agency about that. Quickly just to note, um, we've recently also partnered with CDC and the CDC Foundation around uh, engaging the arts for vaccine confidence strategies. Um, so we can do our part as a small agency, but I think we need to exert leadership and show the points across the federal continuum where you can apply for funding uh, to get in some way into this, to develop programs and to scale them. Um, so we continue to look forward to working with our federal partners and of course, local and state and regional ones as well. Thanks, Sunil. I think, you know, we pay for what we value and I think figuring out how to lift up the value of the arts is so important. So we just have a couple minutes left and I wanted to go around the horn. Um, this is a magical day and it's such an amazing opportunity to be able to listen to one another and share ideas. So Renee, if you could make one wish for a policy that would create sustainable arts and health, what would that wish be? Well, it's starting already in the UK, even Massachusetts, this uh, arts prescription. I think that's a really important piece. The fact that um, uh, therapists now, uh, board certified music therapists, are receiving uh, government funding in something like 22 states in the U.S. So that could grow. I'm sorry, it's not one wish. It's you know, <laughs> there okay. are a couple of things. I have to say, Susan, by the way, is an extraordinary visionary. Please watch Neuro Arts because she is she has her her hand on the pulse, and it's it's great what she's doing. I'm so thrilled to be doing this too. You but are the my other wish thing, come true. Well, well, the other thing is philanthropists, private philanthropists, do a lot for us in this country. In fact, none of our arts organizations would survive without them. And so I want to th just really think of them and thank them because the research that's been done on children, for instance, by orchestras, childhood development and arts training is really important and needs to be better known. But my real wish, if every Walmart has a nail salon, why can't we have kiosks that are giving out health care prescriptions for music training, for anything you might want, for anything parents might need. Um, this is the type of thing that can go hand in hand with AI, which is now going to be prescribing actual uh, medicine to us in these big box stores. So that would be my wish, to have this alongside medicine. I love it. I love it. You know, and we haven't talked a lot about the business community, but the business and the workplace community is also another partner, as is technology in terms of policy, right? It's public-private, but it's all these other sectors. Sunil, how about you? What's your wish? Oh, dear. Um, well, I, I, think, I think it is really to reawaken. Uh, uh, you know, I think of foundations as a big, you know, Renee mentioned private funders, but I would say local government policymakers to reawaken and kind of get them to realize and understand how they can implement arts health strategies in their communities and really to have it at a grassroots level. So a national grassroots movement that really speaks to what Chris said, uh, you know, where the cons consumers, if you will, are very much at the table and, and demand this because they see the value of it for their families and their, you know, their, their own loved ones, when, when, especially when, you come, when it comes to trauma-based uh, interventions, but also for well-being and for positive, mm -hmm. you know, preventive strategies. So I guess community-based grassroots movements. Great. Thank you, Sunil. Aduke, 
What's your wish for policy? For policy would be that an understanding of the importance of, of, of the arts is, is embedded right from primary school. And this, and this division where arts is something off in the corner and doesn't really impact everybody should be done away with. I think as well, I would have a wish that in every doctors and hospital that there's a corner where people can sit and just do art, color, draw, listen to music, so that they can understand that art is part of your life every day. And, and especially in a country where um, there's mental health challenges, so much stress, um, poverty, we, we need to be able to, to have access to art in, in a way that is equitable and is also sustainable. Thank you. And Chris? What about arts education, I think it's so important. Just wanted to note that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that um, if, I, if I had to pick uh, one wish, uh, I'd wish for three more, but uh, I, I don't think that's, <laughs> that's allowed. Um, but but I, I, I think about what is the real healing value of the arts. And at the basic level, it's, it helps us relearn that fundamental ability for deep listening and deep observation. And we, need, we live in an era where we speak over each other, where the loudest opinion wins. Uh, and we've lost that ability to listen. We're too busy calling each other out rather than calling each other in. And uh, I would like to see policymakers start listening more, start engaging more, and start actively working towards consensus. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and instead of thinking about the poor and excluded as a bother or a problem or a liability to, especially in the field of arts and health, they're actually the ones with the answers. They're the ones who haven't forgotten how this works. They're the teachers, we're the learners. And to involve them not just at the table as a participant, but actually to guide us on how this should be done uh, and, and to approach the problems of equity and, and social health with, with humility and common cause. Uh, basically, my wish is for a revolution of the heart. Oh, yes. Beautiful. Wow. Yes. That's that, yes. yes, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. That's actually what it should be. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, this has been an amazing um, time to just hear more of your thinking. Um, Renee, I'd love for you to to share a little bit about sort of how you see the future for um, sound health and for the work at, at NIH. Well, one of the things that troubles me because I also nurture young artists uh, and performers is how few of them can actually work in their chosen field. So that's a huge body. I, mean, I can't tell you how many stores I walk into and some, some young woman will start crying and say, I, I went through school and I had to pay off my debt. Um, so we should, we should give them opportunity to, for service and, and really help them understand also that this is such a wonderful way to use their talent and, and focus on really helping people. As you said, we have so much to learn from everyone in our communities and, and think of the mental health challenges that have come out of COVID. And loneliness and isolation have been increased, uh, which is very troubling also for our, our young people. So that, that would be something that I would love to, to think about how to incorporate this talent in our country. That is, that is as you said, underappreciated. Really, we, we don't value the arts in the U.S. the way I would love to see us value it. I mentioned the Neuro Arts Blueprint when we began, and this is a, a, a roadmap that will be unfolding over the next five years. The release is, as you said, December 1st, and I invite you all to join. Um, you can go to neuroartsblueprint.org to sign up for the release. The idea is to try to work together with the WHO and others to really create a strategy and a plan to make all these wishes and dreams come true. So thank you so much for your time today, and we're really looking forward to the rest of the day. Thank you.